Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Delighted to welcome Tristan Hunt to this Jaipur Literature Festival. Now, many of you are familiar with Tristan for his very, at least two seminal works on history. One was Building Jerusalem, and now the Ten Cities of the Empire, uh, both in some way connected with urban history, the Victorian project, that's one facet of Tristram. He wears another, maybe more exciting, sometimes more challenging hat, that of, uh, he used to be the shadow education spokesman for the Labour Party till he was very unceremoniously purged <laughs> by people who thought he was all wrong. Uh, so at present, I think he's more history, less Labour, or less politics. <laughs> Tristram, you're going to give up. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here this morning. I can't think of anywhere more splendid to spend my wilderness years than at the Jaipur uh, Literary uh, Festival. I just want to begin the... Ladies and gentlemen, on the 30th of June, 1997, the 99-year lease on the new territories came to an end, and Great Britain handed back Hong Kong to the People's Republic of China. At the stroke of midnight, the Union Jack was lowered to the strains of God Save the Queen. The Hong Kong police ripped the royal insignia from their uniforms and Red Army troops poured over the border. Steaming out of Victoria Harbour as the Royal Marines played Rule Britannia and Land of Hope and Glory on the last symbolic voyage of the Royal Yacht Britannia, Britain's last governor, former Conservative Party chairman Chris Patton, wrote... That night, we were leaving one of the greatest cities in the world, a Chinese city that was now part of China, a colony now returned to its mighty motherland in rather different shape to that in which it had become Britain's responsibility a century and a half before. In his own memoirs, Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, recalled of the ceremony a tug, not of regret, but of nostalgia, for the old British Empire. He also admitted to a startling failure to appreciate the historic significance of the return of Hong Kong as a rising, newly prosperous China sought to take its place in the world and shed the memory of its century of humiliation at the hands of British, French and American forces. There is also this rather curious story of Tony Blair as the, the newly elected Prime Minister flying from Britain uh, to Hong Kong, arriving on a VC-10, incredibly jet-lagged, um, whereupon the Chinese Premier thought he'd test out Tony Blair's knowledge of William Shakespeare, um, which was not great. Um, so it wasn't a, a, a tremendous start. But there was one member of the British delegation keener to cling on to the past. In a confidential diary entry entitled The Great Chinese Takeaway, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales laid bare his despair at seeing the crown colony return to the mainland. Watching another piece fall from his family inheritance, the Prince of Wales lamented the ridiculous rigmarole of meeting the old waxwork Yang Zemin and the horror of watching an awful Soviet-style ceremony in which Chinese soldiers goose-step onto the stage and haul down the Union Jack. And it's so heartening the Prince of Wales no longer makes these kind of gaffes. But Charles, Philip, Arthur, George Mountbatten Windsor knew all too well that when his time came to assume the throne, the loss of Hong Kong meant that Britain's imperial role would be long past. Such is the end of empire, I sighed to myself. But if the British Empire has indeed come to an end, its legacies remain nonetheless apparent all around the world. And the most compelling of these phenomena still with us is, I think, the chain of former colonial cities from Dublin to Mumbai, from Melbourne to New Delhi, 
So my book seeks to explore that imperial story through the urban form. Ten cities charting the rise and fall of the British Empire, charting the changing character of British imperialism through the architecture and civic institutions, the street names and fortifications, the material culture and the ritual. Because part of the purpose of the book is also to move the debate about our colonial history from so much of the good and bad cul-de-sac cul in which we find it. The history of colonialism covered in this study suggests a more diffuse process of exchange, interaction, and adaptation, which also shaped us in Britain as much as it shaped the world. So what does the history of these cities reveal? My story begins on the eastern seaboards of America, where in the mid-17th century, a band of Puritan merchants and settlers sought to craft a New England, getting away from the Catholic despotism of Stuart England. And famously, they decided to build a city on a hill, in the words of Governor Winthrop. And they called it Boston, after the town in Lincolnshire where one of them came from. They wrote, this neck of land is not above four miles in compass, in form almost square, having on the south side at one corner a great broad hill whereon is planted a fort. And what you see, if you can see this picture, is how nautical Boston was at the time. Uh, it's all been infilled since. It's infilled in the 19th century. But this was a trading seaport. And it was also a place of goods as much as godliness. Because during the 18th century, Boston, Philadelphia, New York were regarded as much part of British culture as Exeter or York or Leamington Spa. And the materials that went into Boston, uh, the, the pottery, the books, the newspapers, were regarded as part of British culture. And the reason I like this image is you see both the spires of the churches and chapels, and then you also see uh, the, the, the spires of the ships coming in uh, to Boston port. So this was a cultural Anglicanism, whereby uh, the, the culture of the British in Great Britain and America was almost the same. But Boston grew rich on war. It grew rich on the British imperial wars against France and Spain. And after a while, the British Parliament, as we tend to do, asked them to pay for it. Uh, we asked the people of Boston to pay for the Navy and the Army, and the people of Boston didn't think that was uh, a good idea. And we began by asking them to pay uh, through, through a tax on essentially publications, uh, the stamp uh, Act was attempt to pay on newspapers and books, uh, even playing cards. And there was resistance in the American colony about paying these kind of funds. And what I love about this image is that then in Britain, pottery workers in Derby thought they could make money by supporting resistance of American colonists to British government policy. So they're exporting teapots to Boston, promoting resistance um, in the colony. But of course, what went in the teapots was tea. And when the British government sought uh, to tax uh, tea leaves, this is when things really kicked off. And here we have a wonderful image uh, of the Boston Tea Party. Um, in America, of course, the Boston Tea Party is the beginning of that great moment of no taxation without representation. There is also a history that was really an attempt to keep the smuggling routes open rather than pay legitimate taxation. Either way, this was the, the moment of division between America uh, and Great Britain. And Boston goes from being one of the most loyal, royal cities in the British Empire to uh, the heartland of resistance uh, to British colonialism in America. So my first city is Boston, but what often goes with tea is, of course, sugar. And my second city is in the Caribbean, the capital of Barbados, a bridge town. And the history of the British in the West Indies is a salutary and harsh reminder of the raw brutality, oppression, and racism involved in so much of the colonial project. The British became involved in sugar production from the late 1600s using techniques developed by the Dutch 
and the Brazilians. And here, if you can see in this image, this is actually a French uh, image, you see the cane being brought in uh, from the fields. You see it being crushed in the top right-hand corner uh, through the crushers, and then the juice is taken uh, to the boiling rooms. But the Amerindians, the, the native indigenous inhabitants of the Caribbean, were always hostile to being involved in this. The British attempted to import Irish workers um, who, who, who weren't so successful. So then the British began the forced importation of millions of slaves uh, into the Caribbean. And it's the slaves who work the field, and they turn the island of Barbados into one of the richest islands in the entirety of the British uh, Empire. And here you have a sense of the wealth coming in to Bridgetown, into Carlisle Bay. I love this picture mainly because of the Caribbean clouds you see skimming uh, across the top. But the, the importance of Bridgetown was that it was the most easterly uh, of the Caribbean ports. So the slaves would come in from West Africa, land in Barbados, be distributed across the Caribbean islands, and then out from Bridgetown, Barbados, uh, would go uh, the finished sugar products uh, of uh, the Caribbean back uh, towards uh, Europe. And the money from the sugar industry helped to keep funding uh, the growth uh, of the British Empire. So Boston and then Barbados, and my third city of empire in the beginnings of the Atlantic Empire takes us back across the Atlantic to arguably one of the earliest of the British colonial uh, possessions, which was Ireland. Ireland was England's earliest colony, and from the plantations of the late 16th century, the English and the Scottish had settled its lands. And as such, they became a part of the Irish nation. These settlers and their descendants, the so-called Protestant ascendancy, turned the city of Dublin during the 18th century into a showcase of their civilization. We often don't think of Dublin as a colonial city, um, not least because so much of Georgian Dublin, colonial Dublin, was destroyed um, in the latter half of the 20th century as a, as a free island sh sought to shed all the vestiges uh, of a colonial uh, past. And there are these extraordinary accounts of why it was so important uh, to knock down the Georgian terraces and Georgian squares. One correspondent to a 1960s newspaper wrote, Georgian buildings are an offence to all true blue Irishmen. They are a hangover from a repressive past and they must go. Thankfully, one that didn't go is this. This is Leinster House, named after the, uh, the Duke of uh, Leinster, now the seat uh, of the Irish Parliament. But the architecture here was the architecture of the plantations. <coughs> it was a colonial architecture brought uh, into the heart uh, of Dublin. But what we also see in Dublin is the union of England and Ireland uh, together. This is an image from the Custom House uh, in Dublin. And you see in the middle of it, if you can see, Britannia and Hibernia sitting uh, together. So Britain and Ireland coming together uh, under uh, the colonial project. And at either side of them are the ships that are bringing in the wealth to Dublin. And this, this gets complicated in English British-Irish relations, because on the one hand, Ireland is a colony. On the one hand, Ireland is subject to imperialism. On the other hand, Dublin and Ireland get rich through the British colonial project, and many uh, uh, would go from Ireland to work across the world uh, in uh, the British uh, Empire. So Ireland becomes more and more, uh, well, Dublin becomes more and more British in its architecture. Uh, and here you see, uh, in the heart of Sackville Street, uh, a statue uh, of Lord Nelson. Lord Nelson appeared across uh, the cities uh, of the British uh, Empire. But again, after the independence of Ireland, not everyone was totally delighted to have a huge statue of Nelson uh, in the middle uh, of their capital city. And at a meeting of the Dublin City Council in December 1953, a letter was submitted from the Honourable Secretary of the IRA Dublin Brigade, enclosing a copy of a resolution adopted by the Dublin Brigade Council calling for the removal of Nelson's pillar. And this was basically the IRA saying, Nelson's coming down and we can do this the easy way or the hard way. 
Um, and um, Dublin City Council didn't react swiftly enough, so in 1966, uh, it was blown up. So Boston, Bridgetown, Dublin, the three cities of the Atlantic uh, Empire, the beginnings of British colonialism. I now want to move to India, uh, but to get to India, we have to go through uh, my fourth city, which is the master link of connection between the Western and Eastern world, otherwise known as the brothel and tavern of the two oceans, Cape Town. Cape Town, of course, was uh, colonized by the Dutch uh, originally, and it was a provisioning station, it was a watering station uh, for the Dutch on their journey uh, to uh, the Dutch East Indies. Um, and there, the great East India men could pick up water, fresh fruit, uh, fresh meat. And here you see a beautiful depiction uh, by Lady Anne Barnard uh, of, of how Cape Town looked in the early uh, 1800s. But the Dutch were great town planners. Uh, and so here you also see the straight streets, um, uh, the incredibly successful use of water uh, coming down from Table Mountain uh, to, to, to uh, provide the water for the fruit trees, uh, to provide for the provisioning uh, uh, station. Um, and there was always the drama uh, of Cape Town as well. Cape Town caught uh, the European imagination. And you have these wonderful accounts of people having traveled months and months uh, across uh, the sea and then seeing the table cloth, as it was known, above Table Mountain, the white clouds sitting atop uh, Table Mountain and their, and their heart lifts. The British were perfectly happy with the Dutch as the colonial possessors uh, of Cape Town um, when it was a free port open to all uh, trading goods. But in the 1790s, revolutionary France invades uh, Holland, uh, and then suddenly there is a fear that the colonies uh, uh, of Holland, the Dutch colonies, will fall under French hands, and that was unacceptable uh, to the British, uh, because if Cape Town fell into the hands uh, of the French, that meant that the route to India would be blocked. As one Royal Navy official put it, what was a feather in the hands of Holland will become a sword in the hands of France. Uh, and so, in the early 1800s, you see multiple tussles uh, between the British and the Dutch uh, for the control uh, of Cape Town. And by the 1810s, Cape Town uh, is in control, is controlled by the British, and you have this steady process of Anglicization uh, of Cape Town, which so many of the Dutch uh, 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 begin uh, to resent. So what was the prize which Cape Town was so determined uh, to protect? Uh, it was, of course, the riches and prosperity coming out uh, of Bengal. It was all of the wealth which the East India Company uh, was taking uh, from uh, Bengal. And its capital and the capital of British India uh, was, of course, Calcutta. Nothing could equal the, the magnificence of my approach to this town, wrote one visitor in the 1780s. For nearly three miles, the river, which is as large as the Thames at London, is bordered by lovely, well-built country houses with porticos uh, and colonnades. The town is a mass of suburb palaces in the same style, with the finest fortress in the world. What Calcutta symbolized in many ways was the beginnings of the British Empire's journey from uh, a naval empire to a landmass empire, a sense that the British Empire had ambitions to be a Roman Empire, that it was interested in the conquest of land as much as trade and sea. And one man, Richard Wellesley, Governor General uh, of, uh, of India, brother uh, of the Duke of Wellington, uh, really begins uh, to drive that in the early 1800s. He wants India, he says, to be ruled from a palace and not from a counting house. And you begin to see in the development of Calcutta all of the arrogance and hubris uh, of a grander imperial project. So just almost at the same moment as Edward Gibbon in Lausanne is writing the decline and fall uh, of the Roman Empire, in Calcutta, uh, Wellesley is trying to suggest the beginnings uh, of a new uh, imperial uh, uh, project. The riches that flowed out of Calcutta found their destination in my next city, 
uh, of empire, which is Hong Kong, because the most successful export was, of course, opium. It crept in a most mysterious and fascinating manner into the homes of the rich and the poor, and with its mystic fingers gripped the hearts of old and young, reported one British missionary. Men became paralyzed before this new force. From the poppy fields of Bengal came a lucrative trade in this addictive drug. And here we see one of the clippers ready uh, to go uh, from Calcutta. But they needed a port, of course, to land uh, the opium. The Chinese uh, increasingly resistant uh, to the British import uh, of drugs. And so the British alighted upon the fragrant harbor. They alighted upon Hong Kong. And here we see in this image um, uh, the initial warehouses of Jardine and Madison, the great drug dealers uh, of the early 19th century, uh, and also their go-down, uh, uh, also their, uh, their palace. Um, Cape Town was, was a city of the imagination for the British, but so was Hong Kong. What's so bizarre when you read accounts of the British in Hong Kong is how much they refer to Scotland, that this was like a Scotland uh, of the East, the combination uh, of the, f the, the, the sort of lush fern, <laughs> the granite, uh, uh, sometimes the harshness. Um, and the British give over themselves uh, to this tight little colony uh, in Hong Kong, which becomes the major uh, trading uh, port. Um, after Liverpool, after London, Hong Kong uh, is fundamental to the prosperity uh, of uh, the British Empire. But if Hong Kong was a fragrant uh, harbor by my next city uh, speaks to the growth of an industrial uh, empire. And the man who takes us there is the Jardine Madison business partner, Sir Jamsit Sijiji Boy, um, who linked up Jardine Madison uh, with the Bombay uh, opium uh, trade. Cal uh, Bombay, as you know, begins as a, uh, a, a trading port, but it's, it's really the American Civil War which takes Bombay into its industrial phase. The, the American Civil War sees uh, the, the blockade of the southern ports of America, the cotton exporting ports. So they can't get their cotton uh, into Britain. And so Bombay begins to export cotton to Britain, but then begins to think about producing it itself. And so Bombay begins to become really the first industrial city uh, of the British Empire. And why, why I always love uh, Bombay is because it speaks to me of Birmingham and Manchester, that this is a city of enormous civic pride, which celebrates that sense of civic pride through a proudly municipal architecture. Uh, and here we see um, in uh, the train station, in the municipal buildings, this gaudy confection of uh, Venetian Gothic, Ruskinian Gothic, it's like Balmoral Castle meets the Natural History Museum, all celebrating uh, the power of an urban civilization, an industrial urban uh, civilization, um, here also um, at the university. Um, and I'm also drawn to it because one of the designers of it was, one of the designers of the aesthetic of this sort of industrial Gothic was a man called John Lockwood Kipling. John Lockwood Kipling began his career as the professor of art at the Burslem School of Art in my constituency in Stoke-on-Trent. Uh, he then goes to Bombay to teach art, and his son Rudyard is, of course, born uh, in the grounds of the Bombay School uh, of Art. But Rudyard Kipling is named Rudyard after a lake just north of Stoke-on-Trent, um, a beauty spot which his mother and father loved. So, Bombay owns Rudyard Kipling, but I think Stoke-on-Trent does uh, as well. And here we, see, here we see a wonderful fountain in the middle of Crawford Market, uh, designed uh, by Lockwood uh, uh, Kipling. My next city is, is Melbourne. And uh, Melbourne is a, is a suburban city. Melbourne is a celebration of a suburban aesthetic. Uh, 
Um, and just as in the late 19th century the British were discovering suburbia, so it also takes place um, in the colonies. And here you see uh, this remarkable uh, celebration of the domestic uh, aesthetic. But what Australia is also about is uh, a new idea of imperial federation between the white colonies, that somehow the future of imperialism was to be found not necessarily in Britain, but in Australia, New Zealand, Canada. A consciously racist idea about Anglo-Saxon kith and kin, that somehow um, the, 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 the crimson tide of kinship was connecting a new idea uh, of empire. And you have this difficult relationship between those growing up in the, the white colonies, uh, as they were known, um, of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, and the British. And they explored this identity through, through cricket, through test cricket, where you have this extraordinary, re really this sort of very Freudian sort of debate about manhood and identity and the mother country all played out um, through sport uh, and sportsmanship. You also have the development of this martial language of empire, this public school language of empire, of character, uh, of playing up, playing up, and playing the game on, 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 the, on, on the cricket fields. And in the early 1900s, what is, in a sense, so terrifying is that this begins to segue into the lead-up to World War I. And one of the most popular poems in the Australian schools in the early 1900s spoke of a team that is ready to take the field to bowling with balls of lead in a test match grim where if one appealed the umpire might answer dead. My penultimate city is a city you will all know much better than me, uh, New Delhi. New Delhi to the British imagination, as it was being constructed, was, was almost too difficult to comprehend. The great travel writer Robert Byron wrote, Dome, tower, dome, tower, red, pink, cream and white, washed gold and flashing in the morning sun. The traveller loses a breath, and with it his apprehensions and preconceptions. Here is something not merely worthy, but whose like has never been. Just at the moment of decline, uh, the, the hubris of imperialism creates a, a modern Versailles. Um, New Delhi was, was built to last uh, a thousand years. The architecture of Lutchins was consciously neither indigenous nor British. It was an imperial architecture which somehow segued the British character into the soil and culture uh, of India. It meant to seem almost natural uh, in, its, in its hegemony. And famously, uh, uh, the bells were made of stone because they would only ring when the empire would fall. And the empire, of course, uh, was never going uh, to fall. Um, when it was being constructed, um, the man who enjoyed visiting it the most was the French prime minister uh, uh, who, who, who who wandered, who wandered the building site, and he said, ah, this will be the greatest ruin of them all. Um, uh, but of course, it, 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 it wasn't uh, a, a ruin. Um, and what is, what is interesting is, is the degree to which, in a sense, uh, the, the, the Indian uh, uh, governing class take on the architecture and feel and fabric uh, of uh, New Delhi. And here we see uh, if we began with the Boston Tea Party, we end with uh, a, a tea party on the, uh, on the steps of Viceroy uh, House with, uh, with the, the, uh, the handover. My final city, where I end, um, is a city made and unmade by uh, imperialism. Liverpool uh, was a city brought to life by uh, colonialism. It, 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 it begins in the slave trade. Um, it is the great slave 
uh, uh, city, the, the, uh, the, 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 the ships leave it, go down to West Africa, across the Caribbean, uh, and come back. Uh, the riches of Liverpool uh, are built on slavery, and then in the 19th century, it becomes the, the city where um, the, uh, it imports uh, raw materials from the empire, then exports the finished goods uh, from, uh, from Manchester. Um, on into the 20th century, um, uh, Liverpool is the great uh, trading uh, city, uh, growing rich uh, from empire, really right up to the 1950s uh, and 1960s. But no city then is more affected by the end of empire. In the 1960s and 1970s, the Liverpool economy, like the Glasgow economy, uh, like the Hull economy, uh, begins to collapse with deindustrialization uh, and the end of empire. As the British economy turns towards Europe uh, and away from empire, the economic underpinnings uh, of Liverpool begin to fall away. And here we see uh, the Nadir, which are the, uh, the early 1980s riots uh, in Toxteth, uh, where all of the economic misery and decline and political uh, maladministration uh, of Liverpool uh, come uh, to a head. So finally, this book traces how the rise and fall of empire has affected not only the history of former colonial cities, but also the story of our own urban past. Because Liverpool has decided now to take a different route. Liverpool's civic leaders have now concluded that their future lies with a former uh, colony, uh, with a, uh, a country we had a former imperial relationship with China. Um, the city has twinned with Shanghai. It's dispatched Everton Football Club on a series of soft power friendly. It's spruced up its own Chinatown. And no group is promoting this more than an organization called the Peel Group, which is a, 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 a big a private developer in Liverpool. And this image, for those of you who know Liverpool, um, is not Liverpool, but it's how they want Liverpool to be. And in the middle of it is something called the Shanghai Tower. Uh, which is uh, a, a private sector development funded by Chinese money, men meaning to revitalize the Liverpool e economy. They're also widening uh, the old Manchester Ship Canal uh, to allow more imports uh, into Liverpool and Manchester. So whereas once this city of empire was exporting uh, out uh, to the world, uh, the terms of trade uh, have defiantly changed and now uh, it is uh, importing. But not everyone is happy. In 2010, the Wirral Society of Local Conservationists condemned these developments and those quotes who are dead set on restructuring the riverside entrance into the port of Liverpool in the style of Sydney, New York, or Shanghai. In the language of a regional conservation group, they suggested, it is very feasible that many Warillians will not like the idea of being shanghai But new empires are now rising, and their force will be felt in a new generation of imperial cities, most likely British cities, across the globe. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tristan, for that wonderful overview of your book and the 10 cities. Now, speaking personally, you know, the linkages which connect the erstwhile British Empire are still very much before us. I recall once walking down something called Victoria Street in Melbourne, seeing a majestic bronze statue of the old queen, and below it was written that this statue had originally been installed in Dublin and had been transposed there sometime in the 1960s. And I could have sworn I'd seen more or less a carbon copy of that same statue in the front foyer of Victoria Memorial in Calcutta. Now, what's fascinating about empire, the linkages, the, arch the public architecture, which incidentally is less, is, is probably profoundly Victorian. And I think that's a point which has to be, that really the earlier part of empire, or even the latter part, which is only New Delhi, yes. it's really Victorian 
sensibilities which shape the urban landscape of the, um, the cities. Now, coming back to this entire question of how in the contemporary world we deal with this legacy, mm -hmm. with these icons of empire. You've given the example of Dublin, where Nelson's statue was blown up as a gesture of grand anti-imperialism. And I think a lot of the Georgian architecture mm. was also destroyed. And then there is Melbourne, which celebrates it. And there's Calcutta, which has suddenly rediscovered it. And Delhi, which really doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> Overall, as a historian, how do you see the post-empire legacy playing out in the contemporary world? I, I think you can, you can chart how um, contemporary municipal leaders deal with uh, the, the colonial past uh, as a reflection of how they see themselves and, and, uh, and how they see their nation. I think you, could all, you, could un, you can understand and you can't criticize the, the anger and fury of colonial legacies. And so when the, the Irish were bulldozing uh, the Georgian terraces and the buildings, this was a sense that they wanted uh, a, a new nation to arise shed from this past. But then almost economic sentiments begin to take over and they realize actually that there is value based in this. And clearly you can see this uh, today in Kolkata where the extraordinary heritage that is available uh, in that city is a remarkable draw uh, to, the, to the city. I think what's really interesting is, is how Mumbai deals uh, with this. And looking back at the, the history uh, of Bombay, there was always such aggressive modernity about Bombay, such a lack of a sort of preservationist ethic that some of their approach today almost seems within uh, that slipstream. And they have uh, protected some extraordinary, revived some extraordinarily beautiful uh, parts uh, of the colonial past, but also take a very aggressive and modernist approach in terms of a lot of the civic fabric. So I think it goes in, in cycles. Uh, the, 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 I think the, the the sort of often the most advanced thinking about it is to regard the moment of, of British colonialism as often a very small part in a much longer and deeper and richer history uh, of a nation um, and to appreciate it uh, as such. Well, that can be done partially, but if you certainly it can be done in the case of Delhi, which really had a prehistory. Mm. It certainly can't be done with the case of Calcutta or Bombay or even Cape Town or Melbourne, which were essentially creations of empire. And I think half the problem arises when you try and locate a prehistory of certain things mm. and deny its actual history. Well, and and yeah. it gets into a lot of muddle. Yeah, I think, I think you're, 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 the, the, Mel the Melbourne example is, 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 is very interesting. And they're, they're in a terrible state about their history and their sense of their, their history. Their own national identity. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I always like going to visit national museums. And, and the national narrative in national museums is, is, is totally uh, compelling um, to see you know, what is forward and what's about. And if you visit the, uh, the, the National Museums of Australia, if you visit the, the story of Melbourne at the Melbourne Museum, you, do, you don't know what, where this city came from, how it arose, what it did. Um, no one is left out. Everyone is included. And as a result, you have no narrative sense uh, of development. Um, and and it, it speaks almost to a lack of confidence uh, about the form and function of that city. So that's postmodern history for you. But, uh, uh, but there is another interesting facet, again, tracing back to the Victorian legacy, which is the quest for civic improvement. Mm. Now, you find that in Dublin, the, the I think what do you call it, the, big, the broad street commissioners, or the wide street. The wide street <laughs> commissioners. You find it in Bombay, where really the only city where there is a tremendous amount of engagement between the Indian elite and the colonial administrators in terms of the improvement of the city yep. and in terms of developing a philanthropic culture. Now, was it 
a part of the empire project, the urban empire project, to actually foster this? And how much do we get in, say, South Africa? Do we get it in New Zealand? Do we get it in Canada? You see some, some, some really quite considered attempts at town planning through originally in Dublin, the Wide Streets Commissioners. Many of those ideas are followed um, in, in, in Calcutta. But actually, if you compare the British Empire and its urban planning to the French or the Dutch, there's actually a relative lack of a really cohesive sense of what urban planning looks like. There is much more with the, with the, with the British uh, uh, history, uh, a focus on private enterprise, uh, a, 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 a focus on local innovation. The French are so much more determined to have a, a symbol of totalizing French civilization within their, their, their cities relative to the British. The British are more incremental in how these uh, develop. And also, there's just such difference. You, know, you, you begin with Boston, which is essentially a, a public-private enterprise, a mix of, of government support uh, and merchants, and then you end up with New Delhi, which is such a totalizing vision uh, of what a British colonial civilizing force is meant to be uh, about. So there's always, I think, that, that tension, which in other European uh, uh, colonial powers is, is more aggressively governmental. Uh, before I throw the uh, questioning to the, uh, the audience, let me ask a final question, which is we often focus, perhaps disproportionately, on how empire has been received in the colonies. But I think it's equally fascinating to explore how empire is today the, the great existential model which is there in Britain over how to cope with the legacy of empire. Mm. And it's leading to certain very strange and comic consequences. I mean, the roads must fall being one of the examples of, of, of that. Uh, how do you think overall, cool Britannia, to use the words of your <laughs> former leader, uh, is coping with this legacy? I, th I think in, in the academic field, there's quite rightly a much richer appreciation of the, the, the impact of empire on British society and the, the whole debate about how our own cities were impacted uh, by it, our own culture, our own uh, identity. I think that it, it's, it's partly refracted at the moment through our relationship with Europe. Um, and once again, we're having a sort of another internal debate about whether Britain should be in Europe or out of Europe. If Britain is out of Europe, what is our place on the world? I thought we had got over this uh, uh, debate. I thought Britain was uh, a modern post-imperial country whose role was in Europe, uh, but also retained uh, a, a heritage and identity uh, which was outside uh, the common market. But I think, I think the debate about Europe has opened this up again. And then, of course, just the, the transformation of Britain as a multi-ethnic, a multi-religious society and the debate about that. And so exactly as you say, we're, we're debating about whether Oriel College Oxford at the moment should remove its statue uh, of Cecil uh, Rhodes. My view on this is that you, you add to history rather than take away uh, from it. And a very good example of this, I think, is the, is the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, where, you know, Trafalgar Square, the, the totemic celebration of colonialism in the heart of the empire. Uh, and, one of, and we have this empty fourth plinth, and we always have a debate about who should be on there. I thought Gandhi should be on there. Um, but it's, it's left empty as a, as a space for art. And most brilliantly, we had a brilliant Nigerian artist who had a statue, uh, an installation up there called Ship in a Bottle. And it was a glass bottle with Nelson's victory in the ship, but covered uh, in African textiles. Um, and it was a very interesting exploration of Britishness, identity, post-colonialism in the heart of the empire. And there you're adding to the history, you're adding to an understanding of the history, uh, rather than taking things away. Right. Uh, presumably that's for those who could understand what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, think we appreciate it. <laughs> uh, questions? Gentleman with the white jacket. <laughs> 
Mike, Mike. Uh, it may be a slightly strange question, but would you consider Buenos Aires uh, an imperial city? Because although, of course, the Argentine was never uh, ruled by a foreign power, it was entirely developed by, by foreign capital. Uh, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think you could, um, you could certainly make that case, and I think the, 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 the informal empire of trade, if you look again at the, the port cities in, in, in China, many not officially part of the empire, but actually um, their development and culture um, and, uh, and, and civic planning heavily influenced uh, by, um, uh, by empire. And I think there's that, there's that sort of late 19th century, early 20th century, massive export of capital into railways, into construction, right around the world, which, which shapes almost a second tier uh, of colonial cities. So I think you could certainly make that case. Jyoti. Thank you. Good morning. This question is as much to you, Chopin, as it is to Tristram. Oh. Now, I'm wondering, you know, if the mercantile spirit is such a fundamental aspect of empire, what happened to Kolkata versus Mumbai, for example? <laughs> and if you could elaborate a little bit more, perhaps, or talk a little bit more about the Indian diaspora and how Britain sort of receives the peoples of the empire. I, th I think on the, I'll divert to Swapan in a minute, I think, I think on the, the, the Calcutta versus Mumbai question, they're, they're already debating this in the 1820s and 1830s, um, and, you know, a fascinating history of the loss of a, you know, enterprising, almost, the debate we had in Britain in the 1980s was how we lost our enterprising spirit uh, in the sort of latter half of the 20th century. This was the debate in Calcutta in the 1820s uh, as to whether the rural land holdings and, and the nature of, of, of what merchants did with their money somehow undermined that, that enterprising uh, vision. I think certainly during the, the, the 20th century and deindustrialization, you, you, you begin to have a, a different argument in terms of the, um, the economies. The, the diaspora in, in India, the, the, the Indian diaspora in uh, in Britain, the Brit you know, London in the early 1900s, well, London in the 1890s, 1900s, is the heart of the empire, the celebration of sort of colonialism, all the rest of it. But it's the heart of anti-imperialism uh, as well. It's the heart of anti-colonialism. Uh, and so much of that debate is developed by the Indian diaspora in, in London. Uh, and so right from the beginning, you, 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 you have those tensions developed and, and, and prosecuted within Britain um, and, uh, and, and developed very effectively, I think. I think as far as Calcutta is concerned, I think the analogy is quite stark, uh, vivid as far as Liverpool is concerned. I think I, I, I find much more uh, uh, of a parallel there of a vibrant city which sort of declines because the terms of trade, the entire pattern of trade changes. Uh, there's another thing. Calcutta was essentially, the dynamism of Calcutta wasn't bureaucratic. Mm. It was commercial and it was Scottish commercial. It, Calcutta is more a Scottish city than any other place mm. was, ever, ever was. And with the departure, I think what you had was a complete mismatch between commercial capital, which passed onto the hands of the Marwaris, essentially, and a hinterland which saw its salvation in a bizarre, some sort of a Maoist revolution. And this mismatch was never actually successfully played out. So Calcutta just became a monument. It became a monument for people to get out of. And that's what the role of Calcutta has been for the past 40 years. Lovely place to get out of. But well, there's also, on the, on the, the, the Scottish, the, 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 the Scottish connection is absolutely right. Singapore as well. The, 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 the role of the Scottish in Singapore was, was phenomenal uh, in that city's development. Hi. Uh, my name is Trevor Bode. I'm an architecture critic in Vancouver, another colonial city, or maybe neo-colonial, or maybe postmodern colonial. The reason I say this is I was hosted by the Peel Group in Liverpool, and I can tell you that those new towers in your image are at least as much inspired by Vancouver as they are Shanghai. So the uh, empire strikes back in your, in, ah. in, in your argument. Here's my question. I want you to extend your argument.
now, up to the present, see if it works. Uh, I'll propose to you that Bangalore is a new kind of colonial city, but of a different modality, one of Fortune 500 companies, office parks of software companies, and call centers, shopping malls. Does your argument extend to a city like Bangalore? There's a, there's, a, there's a very brilliant book by the radical Marxist Californian writer Mike Davis, City of, Planet of Slums, uh, which, is, which is an account, in a sense, of how some of the traditional colonial divisions were then reinforced by post-colonial governments upon which you layer global capital. Uh, and so traditional bifurcations of race are now in terms of social class, uh, but the, the, the management of space and the coordination of space is still almost colonial in its, uh, in its form. I think, um, I, I'd probably take issue with you because I think that suggests a lack of agency amongst the extraordinary number of entrepreneurs and business people who've created wealth in, in Bangalore or, uh, or other cities, and, and, I, and I think it's much of it's indigenous wealth rather than um, uh, imported wealth. Uh, but I, I do think uh, you can, and that's why I think Mike Davis is, is very interesting on this, I do think you can take some of that colonial thinking about space, the management of space, governance structures, power, into uh, modern urban forms. Uh, hey, my question, this is Nitin, my question is from both of you, if you could answer both. First, what kind of impact the, this generation in the Brit they have of the imperial world, like the shame of the atrocity, the pride of winning over the world or nothing. Second, uh, Swapna will answer this better, I guess. The impact of history, you said a beautiful thing, you said we should add to the history, but the burnt of the history that is so deep into the people that I think those who have ruled, they have to come forward first to you know, address those abusers, those burned, and then the people, some sane people from this world may add to the history. They would be able to the ha add to the history. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think the question of the, the legacies of empire is, 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 is most fraught and most interesting at the moment in terms of the Caribbean. Um, and, and European history in the Caribbean. And there's a brilliant historian, uh, Sir Henry uh, Beckles, um, um, who, who, makes a, who makes a strong case for reparations um, for, for European history in the Caribbean. And he's not asking for money for, uh, for, for the Caribbean today, but in terms of um, education, in terms of cultural connections, in terms uh, of... Uh, of you know connections between doctors I mean in in terms of a richer and stronger relationship based as he suggests uh, on as it were the debts now I think the, the, the history of colonialism I, I put forward today shows how different in different parts of the world and different forms it was the Irish regard themselves as having been you know subject to an empire and yet we know they themselves were part of this this process so I think it is are more complicated. What I wouldn't suggest is what the, the Prime Minister of Britain, David Cameron, did. He goes over to Jamaica, and the one investment he makes in Jamaica is to suggest that the British could help in building a prison. Um, this didn't seem to me the sort of most diplomatic or effective contribution to the development of the Caribbean. Uh, all I want to say is that, uh, I mean, this is a question which really, do, there's an entire session being devoted to the empire. I think on uh, Monday, so you, you could at attend that. Uh, it is an unending battlefield, whether all empires, the legacy of all empires, it's a battlefield and it's a contemporary battlefield. I mean, battles over history are real and quite vibrant and quite interesting sometimes. Uh, all I can say is that to view any pro empire project, whether it's a Mughal project, whether it's a British project or some other, or even an American project kind, as purely an imposition is only partial. There has always been elements of collaboration within the domestic society, which is really what makes the black and white vision of history rather difficult to always uphold. And which is, always, which is really, I think, which makes history far more fascinating. 
that human behavior is not always to be predictable, is always not predictable or doesn't always run on exactly anticipated lines. And this is, this is what's so interesting about Hong Kong. You know, the, the, you know in, in one mindset for, the, for the, chi the official Chinese view, Hong Kong taken by the British, built by the British, this thing we have a complicated... Actually, the story of Hong Kong is, is built by the Chinese. You know, it, it, it is, it is uh, an extraordinary achievement by them, and yet it makes it a very complicated relationship as to how you deal with that, that heritage. The gentleman there with the, the berry. Not so much a question as just to... Uh, the, the statue of Queen Victoria that you were talking about is in actual fact in Sydney, okay. next door to the Queen Victoria building, which was refurbished by Malaysian Chinese. But when they wanted to look for a statue of Queen Victoria, they asked around ex-colonies. Uh, Bombay wanted to sell theirs to them, but the Irish said, you can have it as long as you <laughs> take it away. <laughs> well, thanks for the correction, I mean. <laughs> Uh, there was a uh, thank you. Uh, despite my North English accent, I am a person. I am now a person of Indian origin, and uh, I'm a Bengali Jamai. And my Calcutta wife is a British citizen now. She was singing Beatles songs before she met me, and I was watching such a Ray films before I met her. But uh, my question really is, I wonder how another generation will see it. You know, our kids, are well, uh, they're less interested already, maybe because they're kids, but another generation, will this whole question diminish on both sides, both the good and the bad and the heritage side of, of empire and its consequences? Um, I, think, I, think on, I think on the British side, um, I, I, don't know if it, I don't know if it will diminish, actually. I think, I mean, one of the merits of recent reforms into the curriculum in, 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 in British schools was actually moving away from just relentlessly teaching World War II and Stalin and the Nazis, actually, quite rightly, to, to, to teach a story of Britain in the world. And I think that as, as you know, the, the, the challenges of glo globalization intensify for British society and culture and economy, our education system is beginning to reflect about that and think about us in, in, in a global context. And so you do have more and more A-level study options on the history of the Mughals. You do have more and more subjects uh, on, on Chinese history. So I think, uh, I think there's a, uh, a richer account of it uh, which might actually sort of uh, provide a, a deeper understanding of this history into the future. Well, I hope the interest doesn't diminish. You know, I think in India, we're only about beginning to come to terms with history. And we've go, we'll go through a lot of agonies before we actually successfully manage. And the history of empire is just about beginning to be researched, separated from those who are active participants in the whole thing. So scholarly studies, actually burrowing into the archives, oral traditions, etc. The whole, the sheer richness of that experience has just about begun to be tapped. And I think it'll take a long time before it sort of seeps into the larger consciousness. So I hope there is interest in the subject which persists. The last question. The lady in front. Hi, I just wanted to ask, uh, why, uh, whenever I visit India, and I've been visiting for 20 years, I'm also a person of Indian origin from Britain, um, I feel there's a very strong feeling against the British Empire in India, but I don't see the same feeling against the Mughal Empire in India, and I just don't understand that. Well, you'll be I, surprised. So <laughs> perhaps you can answer that. Uh, uh, I, I can't answer that. Swapa will answer that, but I think... I think, I think it, go, it goes to the point about a pre, sort of, uh, uh, you know, India has such a profound and long history, and we in Britain obsess about, you know, the, 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 the period of the, of the British in India, when actually this much richer, longer uh, account, but I, I can't account for the, the British mogul. You know, in India we have something called the ISI certification, which is a sort of a stamp of approval. 
Now, the Mughal Empire has been given the ISI certificate, which means it's good. The British Empire still awaits its certification. <laughs> so in the official histories uh, of the time, the, the Mughal Empire is something which is to be identified, worshipped. Oh no, Aurangzeb didn't demolish temples. He chased a rapist down the street, uh, <laughs> things like that. And uh, even Amartya Sen spoke about how uh, Akbar protected minorities. Excuse me, Hindus were 80% of the population. Uh, uh, but yes. It is bound up in a lot of political grandstanding, the whole history of the Mughal Empire as well as the British Empire. You know, one of the worst, I mean, I'm often abused for being an apologist for empire. The reason being because I say it was not all bad. And now that's not a popular thing to say. Now, if I was to say that there were facets of the Mughal Empire which were not very wholesome, I'm likely to be branded communal. And it happens. So it's, it's an occupational hazard of how the minefields of history, how you negotiate it. But it's certainly not true that there is a uniformly positive view of the Mughal Empire. I think there are very nuanced views of the Mughal Empire. There's the good and the bad. There's some which we like to remember. The Taj Mahal we like to remember. And, uh, so um, Aurangzeb Road, whose name we change. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Tristan. Thank A you. big round of applause for Tristan Hunt.